I just want to like uh, clarify something. So in the workshop attendees, uh, I'm added under psychology, uh, which I'm really happy about it, but it's not my field of research or work. Um, and I think the reason is I co-authored the paper in 2019, um, published on Frontier in blockchain. The title was The Middleman is Dead, Long Live the Middleman, The Trust Factor and Psychosocial Implications of Blockchain and Decentralization. And I think that's why I talked to Queen back in the day and maybe that's uh, the, explain the psychology. And um, so, but currently I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Ether Capital, which is a publicly traded company. We talk to a lot of regulatories, which I think we, we can work a lot with the audience here. And also I'm a PhD candidate working on the new technology and old crimes, which I shortly talked to Lana about this. Um, and I want to get into like the, why I'm this talk about this is not my direct research, but I'm really interested in this terminology and its un unintended consequences. And um, we saw that like Queen started this workshop and this conference by trying to define Web3. And we didn't, even at the end, we don't have like a clear definition of what Web3 is. And um, I just got involved with like a lot of these terminology and thinking when I, um, on one of the papers I published back in 2015 on usability of Bitcoin. The title was a first look at the usability of Bitcoin key management. And it taught me a lot on how to think about wallets. And back in the day, the question was more about when we talk about sending coins and the wallet returns this error, no free output to spend. The user is just lost. It's like, who's, what's the coin here? Who's what you're sending? Um, but anyways, the problem that in the last two weeks or two, up to two months I've been facing, it's a lot of text here. I start from left to right. Um, so it's more about the, how we define things and the consequences and the regulatory effect of them. So uh, FINRA, which is um, the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, uh, defines cold storage as basically refers to holding your private keys in an environment that is not connected to the internet. It, it seems okay. It seems like a right definition, meaning that as the examples on the website means a hardware that is disconnected from internet, printing on a paper or a USB drive. So that seems like a definition on a website, no harm done. And, um, just for the context, I'm talking about storing cryptocurrencies. <laughs> like, I just want to make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, but there, what happens when then OSC, which is Ontario Securities Commission, which is similar um, authority, but on Ontario, Canada, um, released this um, kind of like a staff notice and like a best practices guide uh, and saying that a majority of assets should be held in cold storage, like 95 to 100%. And this is toward all exchanges, all the like money business, money service businesses, um, just saying that. And another line in the, that report, which is kind of tricky, says cold wallets are not insured by all insurers. So it's interesting when seeing that if you're an exchange, you can basically take this in any way you want. And you can even advertise that all your money is stored in cold storage, like 100% of your exchange money is in cold storage. But now the problem is, are they in a piece of paper in the CEO's drawer or is it like a hardware secure module in a bunker? Like they're both the same definition based on what started as what defining cold storage. Um, so that's a problem I'm facing in the last while, which is like really more regulation problem. And I think there is a lot to learn from the root certificate authorities working on SSL and HTTPS certificates. They've been around for decades and there is a lot to learn from there. And basically my call to action is if anyone's interested in subject, how we can solve this and how we can, it basically comes in proper definition and looking at the edge cases. Um, so that's one of the problems. I have a short one to talk to, but mainly because of the inclusion conversation diversity. Is that okay? For, do I have time to go to one more minute? Uh, you've got one minute. Okay, perfect. Um, so the other thing I, I'm facing, I feel like a lot of audience here might be interested is the definition of Web3 is it global and borderless. So one of the pain points I've been facing was more uh, regarding a lot of nonprofit educational projects that I work with, mainly I work with women blockchain Farsi on a course that they were doing on smart contracts. It's all free, all open source, all um, basically free to use for anyone nonprofit, but it got blocked because the Farsi speaking language was in Iran. 
And there was no way out of it. And there was more on the definition of what Web3 is, what education is. Like, there is a lot of uh, legal aspects of that that I'm not an expert. And I kind of losing hope that industry trying to solve this. And it's all eyes on like, scholars and academia to try to find a way around this. So education should be free. Everyone should be access to, to have access to education. That's kind of my goal. But I'm just going to finish, stop talking here. and. It, uh, questions coming.